And to some of you, this might be completely new. So I'm going to go through the entire story, going back to why the mountain looked like the moon, like you see on the left side here. And I'll talk a lot about what our organization and others have done to bring this mountain back to life. So uh, yes, from super fun to super habitat. That's the theme tonight. Uh, now, I'll just uh, mention real quick, so I'm the director at Lehigh Gap Nature Center, which is the nonprofit that owns about 750 acres of uh, land that is both on and near the Superfund site, but there uh, is a lot more to the Superfund site than just our nature center. So uh, if you've hiked on the AT in that area, uh, you might have been near the nature center, but you might have been on the other side of the gap too. But uh, yeah, so let's get, let's get started here. And also, I should say, this is our 20th year at Lehigh Gap Nature Center. So we're celebrating 20 years of conservation. Uh, and you can see in this picture here what's been accomplished in that time. So we literally went from moonscape to a thriving ecosystem. All right. So let's see if this, oh. this here. Yeah, I don't know. We turn the lights up. Okay. Okay. <laughs> no problem. And let me see. It looks like we're not clicking anything. Yep. Clicker's not going here. Can somebody help me forward the slide here? There we go. All right. There we are. I think we're working now. Yep, perfect. Excellent. There we go. Now I'm good. <laughs> Thanks. Sorry about that. All right, so uh, before we go any further, I always like to start with a map to give everybody an idea of where we're located. And it looks like a lot of you have been there before, but I have our location tonight and the location of Lehigh Gap Nature Center up there at the top. Uh, everybody here has probably seen the Lehigh Gap either up close or, or, or at a distance, uh, but it's the place where the Lehigh River passes through the Blue Mountain in this area here. So I'll, I'll show you a few more pictures of that later. But from our current location, it is about 40 or so minutes away uh, from Allentown, a little closer to 30 minutes. But it's not far from anywhere in the Lehigh Valley. So if you like hiking, if you like the outdoors, definitely check it out. As you mentioned, it is a free wildlife refuge. We have a free trail system. So there's a lot to see and explore there. All right. And oops, there we go. Now I'm going the right way. <laughs> uh, and I also like to point out uh, what area of land we're going to be focusing on tonight in our presentation. Because like I said, the super fun site is very large. It's very extensive. So our wildlife refuge includes everything uh, between the word Google and the Lehigh River. So for those of you here, I'll point it out. It's basically this entire area right here. Uh, so very large area of land. It looks flat here in this picture, but we are on the side of the Blue Mountain here for the most part. Uh, two other things to make note of in this image here, we have the town of Palmerton up on the top right. We'll be talking a little bit about that. And we have, it uh, looks like just a, a desert basically on the other side of the Lehigh River north of, of our refuge, but that is actually where the New Jersey Zinc Company used to be located. That was their main factory, uh, the New Jersey Zinc Company right near there. And you might not know what that means yet, but you'll you'll know very shortly. We'll be talking a lot about that factory that used to be in the gap. Okay. Yes. Is north up? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Yeah, so north is up. Yes. Yep. Yep. Absolutely. Okay. Any other questions? Right. Is that Bowman's Town? There? Yes, yeah, and the Bowman's Town is right up here on the top left. Uh, there's a little village called Kittatinny, which is what you see down by where the turnpike goes through. So down here on the bottom left, that's the turnpike tunnel going through the mountain there. So our refuge goes right up to the turnpike tunnel. Yep, and, and we're right alongside the AT in that, that section. Okay. All right, so we are one of a kind. We are the only nature center. Well, might not be the only one anymore, but definitely the first nature center in the country on a Superfund site. And I mentioned this word, uh, Superfund site, a few times, and you might or might not be familiar with what, what that means exactly. So a Superfund site is essentially a polluted area of land that's undergoing cleanup under the direction of the Environmental Protection Agency. So there are lots of sites all across the country that have been impacted by some type of pollution, usually some kind of industry involved. And uh, the EPA comes in, they say this area is really toxic, there has to be some type of restoration here. So they quarantine off that area of land, basically. And sometimes they literally quarantine it, sometimes they'll put a fence up, people can't go into that area. In other cases like this, it's just an invisible fence because it's not dangerous to people. Uh, but we are <laughs> still uh, the first nature center on a super fun site. I don't know, I think what I've heard from EPA, there are a few others that are either in development or might already exist. So we don't always want to be the only nature center on a super fun site. We like to inspire others to do similar things because there are other opportunities to create habitat from 
polluted sites like this. But this particular Superfund site is 3,000 acres in size. So it's very large. It at one time was the largest Superfund site east of the Mississippi River. That might still be the case. I don't know for sure. But it is definitely one of the largest sites in the country. Okay, so uh, we are unique because of what we did there, but there are many other Superfund sites around. Uh, we have gotten some recognition for what we did there. This is uh, the Excellence in Site Reuse Award that we received from EPA in 2014. There's Dan Kunkel on the right side there receiving that award. Dan is the founding director of Lehigh Gap Nature Center, and a lot of what you see tonight would not have happened without his leadership here. So <laughs> you might remember seeing Dan here before. You might have met him in other ways, uh, but Dan was the one who led this whole project. Okay, so let's get into our story now. Uh, so I like to <laughs> explain a little bit sometimes why we're called Lehigh Gap Nature Center, because you'd be surprised how many people get our name wrong. We call us Lehigh Nature Gap and Lehigh Valley Nature Gap and all kinds of funny things. But uh, if you understand what the Lehigh Gap is, our name makes a lot more sense. And I'm sure a lot of you here tonight are familiar with the Gap, as I said earlier. But what is the Lehigh Gap? Uh, as I mentioned, it's the place where the Lehigh River passes through the mountain. Uh, it is a water gap, just like the Delaware Water Gap. And this happens to be the exact same ridge where the water gap, uh, the Delaware Water Gap passes. Uh, this is the Kittatinny Ridge. Locally, we call it the Blue Mountain, but this mountain goes all the way across southeastern Pennsylvania, about 180 plus miles in Pennsylvania alone. So it's a very long ridge, and there are five places where rivers carve gaps through that ridge. Uh, all of them are important for transportation, as we'll talk about later, because they provided a natural passageway through the ridge. Uh, so the topography here, the fact that we have this water gap plays a very important role in the history of this area, which is what's going to lead into our whole story a little bit later on here. Uh, in the foreground here, you can see Palmerton in the, I guess you could call it the suburbs of Palmerton. Uh, our wildlife refuge is on the right side of this image. Okay, top right. Okay, and here's an, another picture of the gap from closer to our nature center. Nice picture of the river passing. And here is our visitor center, what we call the Osprey House. Uh, when a lot of people think of Lehigh Gap Nature Center, they think of this building, but there's a lot more to the nature center than just this. Again, we have over 750 acres, 13 miles of trails to explore. Uh, so there's a lot to see here at the nature center. Let's see if I can, there we go. All right, and, and now we're gonna go back in time. So this is way back in time, but I like to start here. <laughs> I like to start here for an important reason. This is what this region here looked like to the first humans who not only lived in the Lehigh Gap, but the whole Lehigh Valley region, southeastern Pennsylvania. So first humans came here, we believe about 13,000 years ago. These are likely the ancestors of the Lenape people who still, still live in this region today. Uh, and back then we were coming out of an ice age. So that ice age reached its peak around 18,000 years ago, but by about 13,000 years ago, the ice is moving back toward Canada and habitat was starting to grow back. So. When the first Native Americans arrived here, we were starting to see savannas like you see here. There were warm season prairie grasses growing. Uh, you can see some of the trees in the distance there. There might have been a few more trees by that time. But regardless, this was great habitat for animals like you see here. We had woolly mammoths, we had elk, bison, uh, woolly rhinoceros, saber-toothed cats, all kinds of things that we don't see around here anymore. <laughs> but this is why humans showed up here because as soon as there was enough habitat to support wildlife, Humans who were hunter-gatherers back then were following these animals into our area. So as soon as we had these animals, we had people here too. They were following their sources of food at that time. So this is what we started with in the Lehigh Gap. And then going forward, this is the oldest image we actually have of the Gap, at least that we know of. This is from 1812. And you can see how things changed in that time. So we started out with just uh, basically a savanna and grassland like you see right here. But then over those many thousands of years, that grassland, that savanna created soil, which eventually was deep enough to support the forest like you see right here. So uh, this is an early lithograph. It's not uh, super crystal clear, but it shows us what kind of habitat was uh, growing on the mountain at that time. So we had a very dense forest. But we do have lots of records from that era too, some from uh, Moravians who came through the gap back in the 1730s or so. Uh, other records too, and they do describe what types of trees you're seeing here. Uh, we did have American chestnuts back then. We had lots of pines, hemlocks, uh, really diverse habitat growing on the mountainside there. But you can see by 1812, we also had, uh, you know, some more permanent settlements here. We had a farm, like you see at the, in the foreground of this image. Uh, we didn't have the town of Palmerton yet at this time, but Slatington was beginning to form. So you had some scattered farms in, in towns in the region, but it was pretty rural and still pretty heavily forested in 1812. 
1846. This is the first image of the Lehigh Gap in color. So watercolor painting in this case, but again, very valuable because it gives us an idea of what this region is like. Uh, this was a honeymoon resort at that time. There was a little village called Lehigh Gap that developed throughout the middle of the 19th century. Uh, it was known to be one of the most picturesque areas in all of Pennsylvania. We found lots of writings about that. Uh, so people really enjoyed seeing this. And even though this, again, isn't the clearest image, it gives us somewhat of, the, of an idea of what it looked like back then. Okay. And then going ahead to 1875, this is where we start to see a lot of changes. Uh, so 1875, you can see there's a canal system uh, in place here. So I'll point to that the laser here. From home, you can probably see it uh, running right alongside the Lehigh River. On either side of the river, we also have railroads. So the Lehigh Valley Railroad is the one that you see on the right side there. The left side at that time was uh, Lehigh and Susquehanna Railroad. Uh, and then eventually we had other railroads in the gap too. This dirt road that you see there, and actually that dirt road is also shown in the 1812 picture. That is now called Route 248. <laughs> so same road, same location. It's moved just slightly over the years. Uh, prior to that point, though, that was called the Nescapec Path. It was a footpath used by Native Americans passing through the Lehigh Gap. So the gap has been a transportation corridor for a really long time. But the reason we have all this infrastructure here, the trains, the canal, that road there, it all mostly had to do with one material. That was anthracite coal, which occurs very abundantly on the north side of the Blue Mountain, Harmon County, Schuylkill County, Luzerne County. So there's a lot of coal that naturally was deposited up north of the mountain. But the problem was, back then, it was hard to get the coal to the factories. Because most of the factories that burned that coal were south of the mountain. So because it was difficult to dig a tunnel through the mountain back then, it was difficult to carry coal over the mountain, they just relied on this water gap because the Lehigh River already did all the hard work of creating this corridor through the ridge. So all people had to do was widen that road uh, so it could support uh, carriages and, and things of that sort, wagons. Eventually they built, uh, you know, the, what you see here, the rail beds, so they left things out a bit there. The canal was dug out next to the river, so some changes were made, but the hard work was really done by the Lehigh River. So the Lehigh Gap and the Schuylkill Gap were the two primary arteries for coal transportation during the Industrial Revolution. So most of the coal that powered just about every factory in this country either went through Lehigh Gap or the Schuylkill Gap, just because they were the closest to the coal fields. So that's what you're seeing right here. Um, you can also see in the distance there, I'll point that out real quickly, uh, there's a suspension bridge that's called the Finley Chain Bridge. It was built in 1826, one of the first suspension bridges in the country, if not the world. Uh, there are, to my knowledge, no original bridges in that style in existence anymore. But if you go to Palmerton, uh, in the corner of the park, right along Delaware Avenue, there, there's a little memorial that has some of the original chains from that bridge. So it's pretty neat. Not too many people know it's there. I, I like to go look at it. Uh, but instead of uh, cables on this bridge, they used chains that they forged on site next to the bridge. There. So that's what that is. And it was there for about 100 years, actually exactly 100 years, and there was a fire, and they replaced it with the current bridge. Okay, so jumping forward, 1898. So this is where our story gets kind of interesting here. So because of all that transportation infrastructure, the trains, the canal, uh, we had a really good location here for industry. Uh, they already had a way to transfer coal into factories and things in that area. So it made sense to this company in particular to relocate to what is now the Palmerton area back in 1898. So the New Jersey Zinc Company did start out in New Jersey, as their name suggests. And by the late 19th century, their technology was outdated. So they were looking for a place to build a state-of-the-art facility. And to do what they did in this factory, they needed two tons of coal to process one ton of the other material, which I'll talk about. So it made a lot of sense for them to be closer to the coal fields than they were. So they wanted to be close to the coal. They wanted to be close to the transportation infrastructure. So they picked the Lehigh Gap area back in 1898. And what did they do here? So, so this the New Jersey Zinc Company was primarily a, a zinc smelting facility. A lot of people think that things were mined in the Lehigh Gap because it looks like it was mined there. But uh, nothing was mined in the Gap, except maybe some paint ores and things like that. But uh, the mining had nothing to do with this factory here. What this factory did is it brought in what we call zinc ore, which came from New Jersey, a uh, place called Freedensville, which is where the promenade shops are now, Center Valley. So this stuff called zinc ore, which is basically rock with lots of zinc metal trapped inside of it. They'd bring that in by train uh, from those areas. And then what they had to do is process it 
in the factory. They would just put it inside of a furnace, heat it up with coal till it got to a high enough temperature that that metal would melt out. This is what it looked like. So we have our zinc ore right here. <laughs> Shiny rock, but you can't build anything with that rock. The metal's trapped inside. You have to heat it up with coal, and then your end product is this right here. This is a zinc ingot, solid zinc metal. You can make lots of different products with that. Uh, very few of which they made there in the Palmerton area. Uh, they usually ship this off to other factories to actually produce things. But they smelted zinc there. And there were a lot of things that came out of that process too. There was zinc oxide, which they could use. They could ship that off to other companies too. Uh, there was uh, actually a lot of sulfur, which we'll talk about, that came out of this factory. So they actually sold sulfur or sulfuric acid to other companies. So uh, in addition to the zinc, there were other byproducts that could then be sold off at the same time. But this is what they did here at the zinc company, okay? And here are a few things that have zinc. So back then, obviously there's no sunscreen, but <laughs> these days, sunscreen of course has zinc. So that's one modern use of zinc. Uh, tires actually have several pounds of zinc oxide in them, in the rubber. Uh, batteries, of course we have zinc acid batteries. Uh, Duracell battery actually was invented by a subsidiary of New Jersey Zinc Company. So a lot of the batteries that we use today can trace their roots to that company. Brass is an alloy, a mixture of uh, zinc and copper. And then very importantly, during World War I and especially World War II, the zinc from this company was used to make all kinds of things to support the war effort, munitions, airplane parts, paint for aircraft, uh, lots of different things. And to this day, Palmerton's High School is known as the Blue Bombers. That's their mascot because the zinc from that factory helped to build bomber aircraft during World War II. So that, if you ever wonder why they're called the Blue Bombers, that is why. Okay, so 1912, here is an actual photograph of the Lehigh Gap. I think this is the first photo I've shown you. Uh, and it shows you at that time, 14 years after the zinc company was opened, the mountain was still green. The mountain was still full of vegetation, still had that dense forest like I showed you before. Uh, so not very different than what we've seen up to this point. But you can see in the bottom of this picture, there's something new. Down there, we see a material called slag that is piling up right across the river from the mountain. And that slag is the waste product of the smelting process. Uh, basically, after you remove that metal from the rock, the slag is what's left. And they didn't really have a use for it at that time. So they would start piling it up next to the factory until they ran out of room there. So then they started piling it up next to what is now the town of Palmerton. And to this day, you can see uh, a very large pile of slag that runs all along the outside of the town. Uh, it's about half the height of the mountain. So <laughs> in some places, you can really see that dark material. Other places, it has plants on it, so it's hard to see. But if you see an unnatural looking mound at the base of, on, on the north side of the Blue Ridge, or the Blue Mountain, I should say, um, that is that slag pile, okay? And then by 1950, things really changed quite a bit. By 1950, you can see the mountain doesn't have that forest anymore. We have a few trees here growing right along the river because they were a little less stressed there. There was still water to help them grow, but the mountain had lost most of its vegetation by that time. And then in 2002, when our organization came into the Lehigh Gap, the mountain still looked like this. So <laughs> many years, like more than 50 years after that last picture, the mountain still hadn't really changed. It still looked like the moon, it looked like Mars. Here's just a few more pictures. And some of you might remember seeing the mountain like this. I, I remember when I was a kid, when the mountains still look like this. Um, so I've seen it transform over the years. But this is what we started with right here. And this actually is right along the AT. So if you're hiking between Lehigh Gap and the Little Gap back in the early 2000s, you would have seen something very much like this. And actually that didn't really grow back until later into the you know, like the first decade of the 2000s. So um, it looked like this probably up until 2006, 2007, up the top of that, maybe even later, okay? So the question is then, what happened? <laughs> and some of you might already know this, but I'll go through uh, the, the whole history here. So what happened was there were a lot of emissions that came out of New Jersey Zinc Company. And they did not do this on purpose. Uh, just like every other factory at the time, they did not have any technology to stop this from occurring. Uh, eventually, they had a lot of technology in place to capture most of their emissions. But for a long period of time, emissions controls didn't exist. And as you mentioned, they were losing a lot of money out of, the, out of the smokestacks. They were losing a lot of zinc, actually, out of that smoke. They were losing other products that they could have sold. So they didn't want to put all this into the air because those were dollars going into the air, basically. So uh, this was not advantageous to the factory either. Uh, but again, they could not stop it at the time. 
And in this picture here, you might recognize, if you think back to that very first satellite image I showed you, this is very similar. Uh, you can see our wildlife refuge on the bottom here. You can see Palmerton up on the top right. And there is the New Jersey Zinc Company in operation right across the river from us. Okay, so, and <laughs> look where that smoke is going. Most of the smoke went right over what is now our wildlife refuge. And the reason for that was because where they positioned that factory, the gap naturally pulled the smoke away from, from that region there. Uh, it kind of acted like an exhaust fan. The gap pulled air down south towards Sladington. So that smoke naturally on a sunny day would have flowed through the gap and really impacted the land, which is now our wildlife refuge. Okay, and here's what was inside of that smoke. So two things, uh, we'll look at this first. So one of the things, if you saw a really white smoke coming out of the factory back in that time, a lot really white smoke is mostly zinc oxide. Uh, there were other heavy metals inside that smoke too. So you had zinc coming out of the smokestacks, but also lead, cadmium, copper, things of that sort. And being heavy metals, these things fell out of the sky pretty quickly. So these metals did go into the air around the factory, but they fell back down onto the mountain in the other areas surrounding the factory. So very quickly, we had a buildup of toxic heavy metals around the zinc company. But we also had something else. <laughs> if you saw this yellowish brown smoke, kind of smelled a little bit possibly, you might have made your eyes water, or your throat burn. This was sulfur smoke. So a lot of the ores that they were processing at one point in time had sulfur inside of them, what we call sulfide ores. And when you burn sulfide ores, it puts hydrogen sulfide, which is the rotten egg gas, <laughs> smelly stuff. But you also have sulfur dioxide and other gases. When these things mix with water in the clouds, it makes acid rain, acid precipitation. So in addition to having this heavy metal buildup on the mountain, you had acid precipitation falling all around the factory. Uh, and this wasn't super widespread. It was mostly concentrated around the factory. Uh, but really, that's what, what the big issue was. Uh, what happened was, yes, the, the metals built up, and that was somewhat toxic to the plants in the mountain. But the bigger problem was that as this acid precipitation fell over the decades, the soil got more acidic. And when the soil gets too acidic, nutrients start to leach out. The nutrients wash it away. So trees weren't getting their vitamins and minerals in their diet anymore. And then also, as soil gets more acidic, the metals get more toxic. They can move around a little bit more easily, and it's easier for the plants to eat those metals up. So it was a combination of these two things, the heavy metals and the acid that killed off the vegetation on the mountain. And again, this is 3,000 acres that, that was impacted by this. Okay, and then of course, without trees, there's nothing to hold the soil in place anymore, especially on a mountain. So without those root systems, we lost one to two feet of topsoil very quickly. Mm -hmm. And think back to that picture from the ice age that I showed you before with the woolly mammoths. It took since that time for that soil to build up. And it only took a few years for that mm -hmm. soil to wash away on the mountain. So it didn't take long for that to disappear. And that's why it looked like the moon. It wasn't just the trees that were missing, but also that topsoil that was there originally too. Okay, and here are just some statistics that we, we've gotten. Uh, about 1,500 kilograms of sulfur dioxide per hour came out of the smokestacks in one point in time. So this is peak. So uh, it wasn't always quite this bad, but this was the peak emissions. Uh, 47 tons of cadmium per year, 95 tons of lead per year, 3,500 tons of zinc per year. And again, this is money that was coming out of the smokestacks too. They didn't want to lose 3,500 tons of zinc per year through their smoke, okay? Uh, so then I like to ask, so I, I stole this slide from our elementary school programs because you know the kids get a kick out of it, but who would build a nature center in a place like this? You know, we tell the kids, you might expect to see Martian here, like these ones from Toy Story, or a Mars rover or something of that sort. But most people wouldn't see this as the ideal location for a nature center. Uh, you know, there wasn't much nature to be found back in 2002. Uh, but our organization thought otherwise. We realized that this is a really good location for a nature center because we're on the Kittatinny Ridge, we're on the Blue Mountain, we're right next to the Lehigh River. So if we brought nature back, this would actually be an ideal location for a nature center. And of course, the Appalachian Trail was already here at that point in time. So we have the potential to build a trail system that can even connect to that Appalachian Trail on top of the ridge. So there was a lot of potential here, but it would take a lot of hard work to get there. And I mentioned this guy before, Dan Kogel. He's the one who organized the volunteers, worked with EPA, worked with other partners to get this done. And here's the result of all that hard work. Uh, and this is from 2008, so it's changed a lot more since then. I'll show you some more recent pictures later. But you can see how the mountain transformed. So we had got Nature Center, which was led entirely by volunteers for many, many, many years, including during this era, uh, was responsible for bringing this section of mountain back to life. 
And a lot of what we've done here, our methods of restoration have then helped other people restore other sections of the Superfund site. So we will get to that shortly here. But how do we go from Superfund to Superfund? <laughs> So, you know, it was a moonscape. Now we have all kinds of programs. There's a lot of things going on, which I'll show you later on. But uh, let's talk about the whole Superfund story again. So 1983 is when the Superfund site was established. And this is one of the first Superfund sites in the country. This was one of the top priorities for EPA when the Superfund site was, or Superfund program was established back in the 80s. Uh, this Superfund site is so complicated, so large that there are actually subunits to the site. Uh, we are on what we call Operable Unit 1, which focuses on restoring the mountain that was impacted. But there's also uh, a focus on that slag pile, just restoring that area. Uh, there's a focus on fixing up the town of Palmerton, which was impacted by this. Um, Palmerton was built by the zinc company. The zinc company did a lot of great things for that town. Uh, the zinc company was great socially and economically, but there was an environmental impact that had to be addressed. So EPA helped with that. And then there's also all the water that drains off of this site. So that's another focus for the restoration. They have four units focused on these different issues. So I'll focus tonight on operable unit one, since that's what we're part of. Um, but there has been a lot of other work ongoing across the site, too, which I'm happy to talk about if you have questions. But uh, here's the thing. So when you have a Superfund site, you can't just do whatever you want. EPA does establish some goals and some rules that you have to follow. And these rules are what we call the record of decision. You know, on the mountain, for our part of the Superfund restoration, we had three rules that we had to follow. First of all, we had to revegetate with native species. So we had to plant certain plants that have been in this region for thousands of years, because if we're going to bring native wildlife back, they need a really good foundation to that ecosystem. So native plants is what we had to plant here. Number two, we had to stop erosion. We had to stop all that soil from continuing to wash up the mountain. There really was not much left, but there was some subsoil in place that we had to hold there onto the mountain. And then last but not least, they said we had to keep the poisonous metals out of the food chain. Uh, they did not want us planting anything on this mountain that would eat the metal out of the soil. Because if the plants are eating the metal out of the soil, it's going to get inside the leaves of those plants, which could then be eaten by insects and other types of creatures, which can then pass that contamination up the food chain to other things. But what could happen is maybe there is a caterpillar that has metal inside of its body that's eaten by, let's say, a scarlet tanager. As Scarlet Tanager goes down to South America for the wintertime, it could carry that pollution way off of our site. So we didn't want those types of things happening. So EPA said, keep the metals locked away on site out of the food chain. Okay, and there are a lot of ways that you can go about doing this. And I should mention at this point, who pays for all this? So, <laughs> so we are a small nonprofit. We have free staff now, lots of volunteers who support what we do. Uh, we cannot possibly afford to spend millions of dollars per year restoring the Superfund site. But luckily for us, according to the Superfund program, there is a responsible party. And usually that responsible party is the company that causes the damage, which makes a lot of sense. In our case, unfortunately, the zinc company went out of business in 1980, so shortly before this became a Superfund site. But in situations like that, when the company goes out of business, they figure out who merged with that company, who bought that company. And what happened was back in the 1950s, a company called Gulf and West, a big conglomerate, bought up a bunch of companies across the United States, one of which was the New Jersey Zinc Company. Gulf and Western eventually became Viacom. Viacom became CBS Television slash Paramount. The name goes back and forth. So CBS and Paramount now pays all the bills for the Superfund restoration, even though they did nothing to hurt this land. They basically inherited that pollution. So we like to say they own the pollution. They don't own any of the land around here, but they own the pollution. And I can say that CBS slash Paramount slash Viacom, whatever their name happens to be at the moment, um, they have gone above and beyond to help with this restoration. So there are many companies that try to do the bare minimum on Superfund restorations, but CBS has really helped us out. And they've given us the space to uh, really experiment with things, try things out. And they knew full well that our experiments might not work out, but they gave us the opportunity to do that. And it really paid off in this case, which is really, really cool to see. So let's talk about this here. So what you're seeing here in the 1990s is the very first attempt at restoring Superfund site. And this here is what we call the eco loam restoration. You can see it doesn't look very natural. We have these switchback roads zigzagging across the mountain, many miles of roads, in fact. And it gave the mountain a terraced appearance. And you can still see this on satellite pictures to this day. If you drive through Palmerton, especially in the wintertime, you can still kind of see this from Delaware Avenue. So it's not the most natural restoration method. But what they did was, again, they carved these miles of roads under the mountain. They drove trucks on those roads, and they spread a combination of sewage sludge and 
fly ash from power plants and all kinds of native plant seeds. And things grew pretty quickly. You can see here it is green, but the problem was they didn't really do any kind of management after the fact and nothing but invasive plants grew there within just a few years of this restoration effort. So it was green, but it was the wrong kind of green. The problem with invasive plants is that they don't really support any native wildlife. So yes, this was green, but we might as well have just had plastic plants growing on the mountain. Does this serve no ecological benefit whatsoever? So they did their best. We're glad they did this because if somebody hadn't done this kind of project first before us, we wouldn't have known what mistakes we had to learn from. So uh, they've since revegetated this again with other methods, and it's a lot better these days. But we learned a lot from what they did on the Ecolome site in the 1990s. And this is not part of our wildlife refuge. This is actually on the other side of the gap, uh, the east side of the gap, kind of behind the town of Palmerton. So, uh, so that gives you an idea of where it's located. But let's jump ahead here to our method, which is a lot different. So instead of using a really engineered approach like they did on the Ecolum site, we chose to use nature to guide our method. And when I say we use nature, what we did was we looked at natural conditions that were similar to our situation. And we looked first at post-glacial Pennsylvania. So we go back to this picture now with mammoths. Uh, we were trying to figure out what grew really well in those conditions because after the glaciers left, uh, the, the land was pretty much scraped clean. We had a lot of rocks. It was very barren, it was very dry. So we wanted to figure out what were the first plants to grow back in that very harsh environment. We also looked at a place in southeastern Pennsylvania, Chester County, called the Serpentine Barrens. And you might be familiar with that area. The Serpentine Barrens, there are naturally high concentrations of metals in the soil. Uh, it's just part of the bedrock there. So there's just a lot of metal in the soil. And again, we wanted to figure out what grows really well there. Because if it grows well there, it might do well in the Lehigh Gap, too. And you call these things ecological models. You're trying to compare your situation to something else. So it turns out that the exact same type of plant thrived in both of these conditions. And that plant was prairie grasses, <laughs> native warm season prairie grasses. So things that look a lot more like wheat than grass on your lawn, probably. Um, they grow to be sometimes five, six feet tall. I'll talk more about the root systems and stuff later, but they're very unique looking, as you can see here. So I have just a selection of species. There are a lot of others that, that we looked into. But we thought if these types of grasses did really well after the glaciers left Pennsylvania, and if they do really well in the Serpentine Barrens, there's a good chance that they will grow in the Lehigh Gap. But we didn't know for sure. This was really all just a hypothesis back then. But we wanted to do our experiments with warm season prairie grasses to see if they would work. Okay. So then, how do you get things like that to grow on a moonscape, a literal moonscape? Well, starting in 2003, we began planting test plots, which were just experimental areas on the mountain. Uh, there are 56 test plots all along the ridge, uh, and they were mostly about one acre in size. And what we did was we planted a different recipe of seed and soil in each one of these. We were just comparing and contrasting. We wanted to see, number one, would any of these warm season grasses grow at all? And number two, if they did, we wanted to know which, which species did the best, and also what type of compost would best support the growth of these plants. So in our test plot, we really had two variables, two things that we were testing. We were testing grass species, we were testing compost. Everything else stayed the same. So we had four tons of lime per acre in our test plots. And the purpose of that lime was to bring the pH of the soil back up to a reasonable level. The soil was uh, about a, an average of uh, 4.3 pH, which is very, very acidic. Uh, if it would have gotten below that point, we could have had the metals dissolving even further into the groundwater, which would have been a very serious issue. So we put that limestone down to address the pH problem. So we brought the pH back up into the fives, which helped the grasses grow, but it also kept those metals in place so they wouldn't wash away any further. Uh, again, we put compost down that you're experimenting with, and we put uh, fertilizer down. We knew which mix of fertilizers to put on the mountain. And one thing I haven't mentioned up to this point, you might notice in a lot of these pictures, there are a lot of dead trees almost looked like driftwood or petrified wood. Uh, those trees might have died back in the 1940s and 1950s, but this place is so toxic that those trees didn't decompose because we didn't even have bacteria and fungi in this ecosystem anymore. There really was no ecosystem. I shouldn't even say ecosystem. There was nothing here. So this is very, very barren on the mountain, so much so that things didn't rot. <laughs> but uh, anyway, so this is what we put in the soil. I'll just give you a little preview of the types of compost that we experimented with. We had mushroom compost. Municipal waste, duck manure, turkey manure, sewage sludge, straw mulch. We wanted to see which of these things would help the grasses grow the best. 
And then we planted a bunch of different species of what we like to call super grass, which are just those warm season grasses. Uh, there's some more pictures of those. Uh, and here are some of the species. So we had big blue stem, little blue stem, Indian grass, gamma grass, wild rye, and lots of others too that we experimented with uh, over the years. But these are the primary focuses of our early experiments in 2003. Okay. And we were told nothing would ever grow here again. The experts told us, you know, why are you even trying this? Nothing's ever going to grow here again. But things grew back really quickly, believe it or not. So much to our surprise and to the expert surprise, things grew back almost immediately. And here's what change occurred on the mountain in just those few years once we started doing our experiments. This is 2002 right here. Just two years later, that's the same area of land. You can see the grass grew back. So <laughs> it thrived. It thrived, yeah. So at the end of the day, pretty much every one of our experimental test plots grew really well. Some did just a little bit better than others, <laughs> but everything grew to some degree. And ultimately, we selected 12 species of warm season fairy grass. We picked the ones that did the very best. And then mushroom compost just happened to be the best compost that we tested. Uh, so that's what we ended up planting across the rest of the property. So 2006, we got the go-ahead from EPA to plant the entire refuge that had been impacted by the pollution. Uh, so on the upper slopes, you see here, we used airplanes to spread the seed and soil. There's no way we could drive a tractor way up there on the mountain. So we had to get very creative. And uh, these airplanes were loaded up with seed and soil. They flew around. Uh, these are crop dusters. So they, they were uh, used to flying low to the ground. Uh, and they were very effective. They got that seed where nothing else could. And then on the lower slopes of the mountain, we use tractors with spreaders. This is the largest commercial manure spreader available at the time. It's hard to even imagine how big these things were, uh, but they work very well too. Okay, and here's what it looked like in 2006, 2007, 2008, and 2020. So you can see how things have really changed. Okay. So that's, this is closer to where we are today. So you've been there this past year or over the summer or something, you probably see, saw something very similar to this. I was just out there earlier today. It looks a lot like this right now. Okay, so let's go back to these goals though. Remember, we had some rules that we had to follow according to the EPA. Uh, we had to revegetate with native species. We had to stop erosion. We had to lock those metals in the food or uh, into the ground and keep them out of the food chain, I should say. Uh, so let's see how we did with all those things. So yes, we planted 12 species of native prairie grass. So we checked that off pretty quickly, pretty easily. And here's what lives in that new habitat. We have 23 plant communities that exist on the property. So these are all plants that came back after we planted our grasses. Uh, over 400 plant species, 48 lichen species compared to only five in the 70s. Uh, over 800 insect species, 150 plus bird species, and a lot of other stuff too. Uh, back around 2007 to 2010, we did something called an ecological assessment, where we had a lot of scientists come out and record every single species they could find. We wanted an inventory, a baseline inventory of what was living here. So that way, going forward, we can keep track of things. And within, again, just a decade, less than that, <laughs> of doing this restoration project, we literally had hundreds of species living on the property, which is pretty impressive. And then here's just a few examples. We have monarch butterflies that migrate along this mountain. Bald eagles, which we see pretty much daily. This is a rare bird called the blue grosbeak that's been nesting on site since at least 2010. They love grasslands, so you don't find a lot of these birds in Pennsylvania anymore. I just saw one of these today, a little closer than I would have preferred. <laughs> Black bears are getting increasingly common on our refuge. Uh, and we even have endangered species. We have wild bleeding heart and sandwort, which are two species of plant that you don't really find anywhere else in Pennsylvania. Wild bleeding heart does occur in one other location, but well, incidentally, they also had a zinc smelter <laughs> in that location. So there's some association between wild bleeding heart and zinc in the ground. We don't know what that is yet, but, but both of these plants do take up a lot of zinc, but it helps them thrive. And you can see these in abundance where you wouldn't otherwise see them in Pennsylvania. Uh, and here's a, an animal, a species that we don't have in the gap yet, but we're hoping to reintroduce someday. It's called the regal fritillary butterfly, critically endangered species in Pennsylvania. Uh, they love habitats like we have in the Lehigh Gap today, but uh, we need a certain species of violet to help them complete their life cycle. So uh, at this point in time, they can't survive there without that violet, but maybe someday we'll get that established so we can have a population of these. Okay, let's go on to our second goal. So we have to stop erosion. We'll take a look at this picture here. Look at these roots. <laughs> this is a photographer named Jim Richardson who found a way to photograph prairie grass roots. I don't know how he does it. 
But uh, this gives us a good idea of just how different these grasses are from turf grass. These root systems go sometimes 13 to 15 feet into the ground. And they form these dense networks. So you can imagine this is stopping erosion very effectively. Uh, this is really holding that mountain together. Okay, so these grasses are really good at addressing the erosion issue. And then we had to keep those metals out of the food chain. So here you see a picture of a tree that's pulling metal out of the soil. This is a gray birch tree, which we'll get back to very shortly. So gray birch trees that grow on our property are not the best thing to have around. They do eat the metal out of the soil. But how about these grasses that we planted? They're a little bit different. Fortunately, these prairie grasses don't eat the metal. They leave the metal in the ground. What's good about that is all the grass that decomposes after each growing season is building clean soil. If it doesn't have metal inside of its tissue, it's building clean soil. So we have soil forming on top of the metal after the grasses die back in the fall and the winter months. So everything that you see in this picture that's standing up, it's going to die back. It's going to, you know, decompose eventually. So that's forming a layer of soil on top of the pollution. But what also happens with prairie grasses is a portion of that really extensive root system also dies back after each growing season. So we're also having metal or having a soil, I should say, grow underneath the metals. So basically the pollution is being sandwiched between growing clean layers of topsoil. Uh, so this is different than a forest. The forest is only going to build soil on top of the ground. But grasses build soil below the ground too. So we're trapping this metal under the ground. We're locking it away, which is very good. And in about 50 years, we'll get an inch of topsoil in our grassland here. So it takes a while, but it's faster than it would be in a forest, which takes 100 years to build an inch of soil. So it's, it's, it's moving along. <laughs> It'll take a while. But we do have to do a lot of management, because remember, that ecolome site, they didn't do a ton of management, so we had an invasive species problem. But we would have an invasive species problem, too, if we didn't manage the site. And here are our number one invasive plants, butterfly bush, tree of heaven. Uh, I just ran into some of the Superfund restoration folks this morning, and they were surveying our site for butterfly bush, because they want to see if there's anything out there that they have to control. So we are very closely monitoring things to make sure we don't have these species growing. Uh, but then again, we also have gray birches, aspens, and other native species that are becoming a problem because they're pulling the metals out of the soil. So normally you would want to see species like this growing back because normally this is the next stage in succession. This is the next stage of this ecosystem. We have these trees and then other trees that replace those and eventually it would become a forest. But unfortunately, these young trees are pulling metal out of the soil, putting it in their leaves and passing it on to other creatures. So they're native plants, but they are a problem in our case because of that. So what we have to do is, um, here's another picture, I'll, I'll point this out. So, uh, we call these hyperaccumulators because they build up so much metal in their leaves. And that yellowing you see on the leaf there is called chlorination. This just means that that leaf is metal stressed. So there's a lot of metal that's actually inside that leaf. So what we have to do because of this, oops, we have to pause succession, which means we have to stop that ecosystem from going any further past the grassland. Because we love the grasses. The grasses are solving our problems. But the invasive plants, these trees here, these native trees, they have the potential to undo a lot of the hard work that we've done here. So here's what we do. We Every now and then, we'll do a prescribed burn on the refuge. We haven't done this since 2018 because it is expensive. And CBS, Paramount, they don't really want to pay for this every year. It costs about $30,000 back in 2018 because of the insurance for these professional burn bosses here. <laughs> so uh, it, it's, it's not cheap. So we have done it quite a few times. It is effective but it is very costly. So we're going to see what the future looks like with our management here. Uh, but what happens is with a prescribed burn like this, uh, it does char a lot of that material in the ground, which uh, puts a lot of nutrients back into the ground. So all that charred material is very rich in nutrients. And the grasses love that. The grasses are going to thrive when they eat up those nutrients that are released. But at the same time, when we do a burn like this, it boils the sap inside of the unwanted plants. Like the butterfly bush, the tree of heaven, the birches, the aspens, they cannot survive prescribed burn. So this one management tool, prescribed fire, is getting rid of what we don't want, but at the same time helping what we do want. So here I'll just show you some time-lapse photos here. So you can see how the grassland grows back after a fire. If you look in the distance there, that part of the grassland that was not burned is not doing quite as well as what you see in front here. So fire is very effective. It's also safe, believe it or not. We've had uh, scientists from the US Forest Service, Cornell University, elsewhere, they come in and they study the smoke. What they find is that the metals inside of that smoke fall right back down into place. They're very quickly buried by that charred material. So we're not spreading metal in the smoke away from the site. 
we make sure these fires are done very safe, safely. We have uh, firefighters out there. We make sure we do it on a day that's not windy, it's not too dry. So it's a very calculated effort. Okay, so you can see fire does a really good job. But let me go back to this real quick. Almost skip that. So that's what we we have been doing up until 2018. Something we did more recently, though, <laughs> this is actually this past April, we brought the airplanes back for the first time since uh, I think around 2012 or so. Uh, 2012, they were seeding other areas of the Superfund site. So this was actually the first time since I think 2006, 2007 that they were on our property. But what they were doing is reseeding some areas that weren't doing quite as well. So in the you know past 15, 20 years, there were some sites in the mountain that we're growing quite as well as they did initially. So they needed a little bit of a boost. So we added some limestone to those areas. We added some more seed, but we also introduced some new species that weren't originally in the mix. We had 25 native wildflower species. In this case. Uh, some other things too. We have some trees, some native trees that don't pull the metals out of the soil. So we're gonna wait and see how this, how successful this was, but I can say that I did see a lot more wildflowers in the grassland this summer. So I think that was the result of this work. I was hit by some seed that was dropped out of an airplane, and it does sting, if you're wondering. <laughs> yeah, so but these these uh, pilots are incredibly skilled. It's amazing how they fly real low to the mountain and drop the seed right where it has to go. Okay, and then what else are we doing? So what's next? So we do want to maintain the grassland because, again, it's solving all of our problems. But we're also doing something called leapfrogging succession, which basically means that we're skipping over trees like birches and aspens and planting things like oaks and maples. Because the oaks and maples don't take the metals out of the soil. They're not like those earlier trees in that ecosystem. Uh, these ones leave the metals where they are. And uh, what's good about that is we'll have mature trees someday that can provide habitat for other types of species. So we want as much biodiversity as possible within our refuge. So that's why we are planting some trees. But the issue with this also is that even though these trees grow to maturity, the metal prevents them from reproducing. Their, their seeds are sterile. So these trees will not produce other trees. So we can plant trees, but those trees aren't going to spread beyond that, unfortunately. Okay, so I'll just highlight a few other habitats. I'll wrap up shortly here. So uh, in addition to what we've restored, we have some remaining ecosystems here that were not impacted by the pollution. We have wooded slopes, wetlands, a three ponds area that's definitely worth checking out. I love hiking around there. Lots of really interesting birds to see in those areas. We have a healthy riparian forest that grows along the Lehigh River. And we see all kinds of wildlife like these berganser ducks in the river these days. We have seats and springs that you'll pass. This one is along our prairie grass trail. We see a lot of migratory birds there, sometimes a black bear like today. Uh, we have a savanna up on top of the mountain. So this actually runs right along the Appalachian Trail uh, these days. The, re the Appalachian Trail was rerouted, as you might know, uh, along the Lehigh Gap area. And the AT actually goes closer to this uh, savanna these days. And for many years, we thought the savanna had a lot to do with the pollution from the zinc company. But the savanna is actually here for an entirely different reason. A grassland scientist came through and he said, this is actually one of the largest, if not the largest, original grasslands left in all of Pennsylvania. And it's here because Native Americans for many years managed that ecosystem. They used prescribed fire, just like we've done in recent years. Uh, to manage that ecosystem. And they were managing the ecosystem for plants like these that they were farming. These plants need lots of sunlight to grow, so they had to burn the trees to, to help these plants grow. But also, by creating a habitat like this right here, you'll attract a lot of grazing animals like deer and rabbits, which they then hunted. So Native Americans were using fire as a management tool long before we did in the Lehigh Gap area, which is pretty neat. So what happened was they burned the forest so many times that it stopped growing back, which is why we have this Natural hair grass savanna on top of the ridge. Uh, we also have these cliffs, which are natural in the gap. We know about 100 years ago, we had peregrine falcons nesting on those cliffs. Uh, this one here is called Devil's Pulpit. You might have heard of that one before. Uh, we just saw a pair of peregrine falcons there this past summer, and they were pretty active in the area. So it's really exciting for the first time in probably over 100 years, we now have peregrine falcons frequenting the Lehigh Gap area. And that's one of the main reasons we close off the Devil's Pulpit Trail. We want to, number one, protect people who are, who are hiking out there. It is a little dangerous. But also, we wanted to uh, allow these birds to come back to this area. It seems to have worked, which is really cool. And then even under the power lines, we work with PPL to try to manage the ecosystem under the power lines so that it's mostly native plants. And that attracts other species like indigo buntings, prairie workers. 
Okay. And for the last few minutes here to wrap up, I just want to show you what we've done with our Superfund site beyond restoring it. Uh, most Superfund sites look like this. They have barbed wire fences. They say keep out. But because our place is only dangerous if you eat the soil, <laughs> uh, there are a lot of opportunities to do things that you couldn't do otherwise. And I already mentioned we have 13 miles of hiking trails just within our refuge. And those hiking trails connect to the AT, but also the DNL trail. Uh, our efforts here were a really key part of connecting that section of the DNL trail. Uh, so <laughs> now we have lots of bikers come through. We have people who stay up in Jim Thorpe who visit us at the Nature Center. A lot of people from other states actually. Uh, so this is a very popular area for recreation. So if you haven't hiked there yet, please do check it out. Uh, and also the Lehigh River is right outside our door, so there's a lot of things going on there too. A lot of school programs, we usually reach between seven and 12,000 kids per year through our programs, depending on the year. Uh, we do a lot of field trips, in-school programs, after-school programs, summer camps, all that kind of thing. So these are just a few pictures of that. We also have a hop count that, that takes place at Big Gov and Knob, so you might have hiked through that area too. We've been doing that actually since 1961. Our founders started the hot camp way back then. So we continue that effort today. So sometimes we take kids up there to make up an option. Okay. And then again, we have camps and clubs and things of that sort. I'll just fly through these pictures. We have community science projects where we involve the public in research. So monarch butterfly tagging, hawk counting, like I mentioned, uh, bee monitoring, things of that sort. And then we want to take our model of native plants or native landscaping, I guess, into people's backyards. Uh, you know, we, you're stored an entire mountainside with native species, but we want people, no matter how big or small their yard is, to do the same thing because we have a lot of lawns out there these days, and lawns do very little to support wildlife. So we like to encourage people to plant the native species in their yards, just like we did at the Lehigh Gap, um, so you can create habitat. Even if you just have a small container on your porch, if you live in an apartment, there are opportunities to help support pollinators and other wildlife. So we've had a, a, a habitat gardening program to help educate people on that topic. Okay, and last but not least, how can you get involved as a volunteer? Again, we're a mostly volunteer run organization, only three staff there these days. Uh, we have volunteers who staff our visitor center, especially on weekends uh, when the staff aren't always around. Uh, our visitor center is mostly open when volunteers are available. Uh, so if, if you like interacting with people, we never know who's gonna come in this door. Uh, it's very interesting to learn about what people are seeing out on the trails, to hear their stories. It, it's a really neat thing. So if you like talking to people and, and hearing stories like that, <laughs> uh, you might be interested in volunteering at our desk at our visitor center. Uh, our garden group, we have actually over 200 species of native plants just around our building. And these gardens take uh, a lot of work to maintain. So we have a group that's focused specifically on just caring for those gardens. Uh, and there, there are pictures of them doing their work. Uh, our trail crew, so this might be of interest to a lot of you here. Our 13 miles of trails need to be weed whacked and uh, otherwise maintained. So we do have stewardship interns in the summertime who uh, are primarily focused on doing that kind of work. Uh, we have a trail crew, uh, which is all volunteers who help to support these efforts. Uh, so I should mention volunteers build our trail system. Uh, some of you might know Jim Gabovitz, uh, who sadly passed away this past year. He was one of the uh, primary volunteers who helped to create our trail system. And I know some of you here were involved with those efforts too. So um, our trails are, are very much uh, rooted in our volunteer efforts at the Nature Center. And here's a picture of some of our trail volunteers. There's Jim and, and uh, a few others building the trails. And, uh, here's some pictures from trail maintenance a few years ago. Our, our education team helps with our field trips. So if you like teaching, there are opportunities to reach lots of kids each year uh, <laughs> through guided hikes, just nature walks through through the trails around our building. And, uh, we have lots of other types of lessons that we can see here. Okay, okay. Bake of a Knob Hawk Count. Again, since 1961, we've been counting birds up at Bake of a Knob. Uh, during the week, we have an intern, but on weekends, again, we depend on volunteers to help us count the birds. Here are some pictures of that. All right, and last but not least, we have lots and lots and lots of other ways to get involved. Um, I have a picture of the library here because Barb Weeman, who's here tonight, <laughs> has focused uh, her volunteer role on, on just maintaining this library here, archiving everything, cataloging everything. So that's a very specialized volunteer uh, position that we have at the Nature Center. And Barb has done incredible work with that. So, so there are lots of other opportunities to get involved. If there's something that interests you uh, that you didn't see here, uh, even if it's not part of a volunteer group, there are many ways that you can still help us at the Nature Center. So 
definitely talk to me afterward, reach out to me if you have any questions about that. But that's all I have for tonight. So hopefully I didn't go too far past my time. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs>
talking memory uh, from the 2009 U.S. here at the first meeting. Yeah. That, uh, more credit was given to the Native Americans with the initial um, seed bombing and all of that was partly because they had discovered the natural grass burning area at the top of the mountain. They said, oh, look, this is growing. And yeah. It was done by the Native Americans. And then they were thinking about all the other seed possibilities. They yeah. Country. That was you know, some of the early indigenous. That was it's part of it, absolutely. It's because it's it seems to be becoming a big thing around the country. I mean, yes. I'm hearing about it out west and like uh, looking back to Native Americans and oh, hey, how we're going to solve this problem of, right. of uh, forests that have been managed over managed for a hundred years. Yes. Now there's a the fire trap. Yeah. So yep. yep. It, you know, I think all this wilderness really has existed in the United States. It's only after we off a lot of the native people yeah. and the burning stopped right. and it became what we found which was a tangled mess <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah for sure <laughs> yeah <laughs> yes absolutely that's a very good point yeah so um, I, I think the discovery of that ecosystem on top of the mountain did have a lot to do with really solidifying that idea um it, i think the idea first came from the serpentine barons because a guy named bill minio you might know he was involved with DNL early on. He worked down in Chester County and he saw how the grasses thrive down there. So he first had that initial idea from the Serpentine Barrens, but seeing that grassland on top of the mountain, it again helped them to confirm that that's what would have been there and that that would probably work pretty well. Yeah. Yes. So across from your location where the zinc plant used to be, yeah. they the buildings down. Now I see yes. they're moving a lot of dirt around. Yeah. Are they just reprofiling that and capping it, or are they taking the dirt <laughs> somewhere? Or great question. Yeah. Not, not a great story, unfortunately. Uh, so believe it or not, that is not part of the Superman site there. That land that was the factory, that is the brownfield site, which is managed by the state instead of the federal government. And Pennsylvania has more lax environmental laws compared to the federal <laughs> government. So uh, what happens is on sites like that, the landowners, so there's a private landowner who has that now, and they can get a special permit called a regulated filter. And this allows them to bring in material from other states, usually New York and New Jersey, that is contaminated. It's legal to dump in Pennsylvania, but illegal to dump in those states. So it's less polluted than what was there, but still polluted to a degree. Uh, comes from demolition sites, shipyards, things of that sort. So they're bringing that in, and the incentive in Pennsylvania is that because it's illegal to dump in our neighboring states, people in those states pay people in Pennsylvania to take in their waste. So yes, they are redeveloping it. They're going to put warehouses there eventually, from what I understand, unfortunately. Uh, but, <laughs> I know. <laughs> so we need more of those. Yeah, but what they've been doing since, oh my goodness, probably 2012, maybe a little bit more recently, 2014, for many years they've been bringing in that bill there. It just gets higher and higher and higher because they're making more and more money the more of that stuff that comes in. So it's unfortunate. This happens all across Pennsylvania, especially abandoned quarries or other situations where people are bringing in this regulated bill. But it's legal in Pennsylvania, unfortunately. It's legal in Pennsylvania. Uh, so yeah, so that's the story there. Uh, right across the river from our restoration site is that, but it's state managed instead of federal. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on the federal Superfund site yeah. across the river, uh, is is there is there a future nature restoration in there on that on that side of the river? Yeah. Yeah. So that the other side is where the tree planting was done up on top of the ridge. A lot of the gap itself <laughs> along the river still looks rocky because it's very steep. It's really hard to get things established. So they've been trying to replant those areas for a while now. Um, they, they tried again with the airplanes this year, so we'll see if that takes. But yeah, so some spots are probably going to be rocky for a while just because it's very steep. It's hard to get things done. Yeah. Yes. So it seems like this is a really professional program on the Super Fun site over the years to yeah. restore, um, but. But you've said there's only it's only three professionals at the nature center. So who's doing that work? Great question. Yeah. So partnerships have been key to what we've done. So different government agencies, as well as the EPA, but also you know, Forest Service, uh, local colleges and universities, actually across the country, we've got people from Colorado State University involved. So we have this is only possible because of lots and lots of partnerships. So um, one of the things that Dan Kunkel I mentioned, uh, it was important was bringing the right people together. So um, that included experts, 
at academia, government agencies, elsewhere. So, so it just it worked out that we had the right group of people involved. And um, we're still part of lots of networks, like uh, there are a lot of local conservation networks that we're involved with. There's a regional environmental education network that goes all across the Delaware watershed that we are part of. So, uh, yeah, we accomplish everything we do because we partner with some. So the agency that coordinates. We coordinate, yeah. yeah. And EPA coordinates a lot of it too. Um, there's also an intermediary there. There's an environmental consulting firm that is kind of between EPA and us. So they do all that work. So all the restoration on the mountain is done by this environmental consulting firm. So yeah. So we focus on managing our refuge, managing our trails, um, but only invasive species control, prescribed burns, that all happens under that consulting firm. So they, they do that. Yeah. Yes. What made Dan Cumble so good? <laughs> good question. Yeah, he was a retired, well, actually not at the time. He was still teaching biology at Green High School when he started this project, <laughs> and he retired early. He actually took this medical for, I think, at least half a year, maybe a full year to get the project started. And eventually, once it got going, he retired early, took this on. So, yeah, he's a uh, just a good leader, you got to get together and you're the right, right people too. Yeah, this was not his idea. There was actually a guy named Grant White who was a local conservation, uh, you know, professional. Actually, I don't know what he did for a living to be honest, but he was very conservation minded. And he had this idea back in the 1960s to build a nature center in the Lehigh Gap. So it was his idea, but it took many years for other people to think, well, maybe that could actually happen. So, <laughs> yeah, right. So that's where it came from. So the seed of the idea started many decades before then, and it really all began at the big of an Alpac watch. A lot of our volunteers started up there, and they would just have conversations. When birds weren't flying, there was lots of time to talk about things, and, and they came up with these ideas and got them. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Absolutely. Yes? In the beginning, you mentioned about companies came in and helped with the restoration. Yeah. Can they also buy land or buy the reserve of land? No. Yeah, this is still, there are lots of different landowners across the Superfund site. Like in our case, they get about 750 acres, but you also have state game land, you have National Park Service. So, uh, yeah, it was just a lot of different landowners. Um, EPA says what we have to do to restore the land, but each landowner does have some control over specifically what happens. According to what EPA wants. <laughs> yeah, yep. So that yeah, nobody, none of the companies came in and bought any additional land. It's just who was already there. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, of course. Absolutely. It's going to be around here for a while. Yeah. And talk to me. Okay. Um, we do have. Thank you. Oh. <laughs> it is our speaker. Oh, wow. Among other things, I am a potter. Oh, my gosh. It's beautiful. Thank you very much. Thank you. It's really nice. Wow. Wow. <laughs> what is the announcement that we need to make? We are taking a bit of a different meeting style in the future. In January, February, and March, we will not meet here. We will have only a Zoom meeting, much like we did during the COVID time. Two basic reasons. One, occasionally we have bad weather here. So we don't have to worry about that. But I even think even another thing that we discovered from the COVID period, we can, when we meet here and have our speaker here, he has to be in the Lehigh Valley that night. January, February, and March, we can have speakers from almost anywhere. And in fact, uh, we're going to have one in February that is from Massachusetts, New Hampshire. New Hampshire. And then in March, we have, where is that? Uh, uh, she's Massachusetts. She's Massachusetts. And then where is Beth from? Yes. 
New Hampshire. So we have two speakers right now out of the area. So makes it easy for speakers. Yeah. Um, <laughs> maybe, but at <laughs> least we can have speakers from out of the area. And thank you, Bill, Mark, Danielle, for the expertise we have with Zoom and other things to be able to do this. November, our meeting will be here as usual. We will have also a Zoom contingent in, uh, in November, January, February, March, Zoom only. And then back April, May, and June, we'll go back to the double uh, format of both here and um, on Zoom. Thank you all for coming. See you next time. Oh, okay. <laughs>